I'm uh, Kate Seeley, Senior Vice President of the Middle East Institute, and I'd like to welcome you to today's talk on Israel's, uh, on perceptions in Israel's relations with the European Union. Our guest and presenter today is Dr. Sharon Pardo, who's visiting us from the Department of Politics and Government at Ben Gurion University in the Negev. Uh, he's also Director of the University Center for the Study of European Politics and Government. And Dr. Pardo recently co-authored an article on the intersection of trade regulation and foreign policy in EU-Israeli relations, which MEI uh, was pleased to release in its 2015 uh, winter uh, program. So please, um, afterwards, we'll be selling copies of this for $10. I hope you can uh, pick it up. It's a very interesting exploration of this unique uh, relationship. And when we heard he was in town, uh, we were keen to have him join to elaborate on the very uh, complex uh, nature of uh, EU-Israeli relations, especially in light of the recent Israeli elections. Uh, Israel has strong EU ties. Uh, I think many people in this room know uh, the EU is Israel's largest trading partner, accounting for nearly $30 billion in trade uh, in 2013, or about a third of Israel's total foreign trade. Relations are strong in other areas. Uh, Israeli and European institutions collaborate extensively in science, technology, uh, agribusiness. Uh, there are frequent cultural exchanges, and uh, close defense ties exist between uh, Israel and many uh, European governments. But there are growing strains in the relationship uh, related to several issues. And on the European side, they're related to ongoing Israeli settlement policies uh, and the lack of progress on the peace process. Uh, Europeans have been a little more willing than their American counterparts to uh, translate their displeasure, their displeasure over the occupation into actual policy. And then on the Israeli side, uh, there's a perception that EU countries are increasingly anti-Israeli or more critical um, uh, or unfairly critical of Israel and tolerant of a growing anti-Semitism. Uh, just last February, I think we all recall uh, Bibi Netanyahu uh, calling on European Jews uh, to move to Israel after terrorist killings, and of course that created a, a backlash among European leaders. So against this backdrop, uh, where is the EU-Israeli relationship headed? What are the key challenges it faces? Uh, Mr. Pardo will examine these and other questions in a presentation of about 30 minutes uh, to be followed by a Q&A. So once again, it's a real pleasure and an honor to have you here, Mr. Pardo, and I'd like to uh, invite you to the podium. Well, thank you very much, Kate, and thank you very much for uh, your kind introduction. Um, allow me first um, to thank uh, the Middle East Institute for organizing this event. Um, it was a pleasure working with your team uh, on the article. You are so professional, and thank you so much for that. Uh, and of no less importance, I'm really honored and thankful um, to all the participants here uh, for sharing this afternoon with me. Now, I know that the EU may not be the foremost uh, on the agenda here in Washington, especially these days. Um, and still, um, you all decided to join, uh, to join us this afternoon. Um, and I know that you are here because uh, most of you are really interested in the Middle East and in Israel. And I would argue that today, if you want to understand the Middle East, and if you want to study Israel, uh, you must also study Israeli-EU relations, because the EU is not only Israel's immediate neighbor, and yes, since 2004, uh, Israel and the EU actually share a border, Cyprus, um, but today the EU is one of the most important international actors for the future of the State of Israel. So my presentation today is really based on an ongoing research on Israeli perceptions towards the European Union, completely different from the article that was published in the MEI, so this will be uh, another topic. And the research is concerned with the reception of a theoretical and a much discussed concept of Europe as a normative power. But I promise not to bore you with theories uh, this afternoon. The presentation is also uh, part of my new book titled Normative Power Europe Meets Israel, uh, Perceptions and Realities, which is due for publication uh, this coming August. 
So just before I'll dive with you into the key Israeli perceptions, and maybe some would say misperceptions of the EU, I would like to briefly mention some major facts regarding uh, Israeli relations. Now, Israel's relationship with the EU began actually in early 57, even before the Treaty of Rome entered into force, when Israel really explored the possibility of full membership in the European Economic Community. In 1957, Israel was on its way uh, to full membership in the European Economic Community. However, this is clearly not the case. In April 58, uh, Israel became the third country in the world after Greece and the United States to request the establishment of a diplomatic mission accredited to the EC. And in February 59, Israel was the fourth country in the world to formally establish full diplomatic relations with the EC upon the insistence of David Ben-Gurion, uh, the Prime Minister. Now, since then, trade, economic, political, scientific, and cultural cooperation have consolidated Israeli relations. Now, we've just heard some trade figures, but these are the trade figures for 2014, and currently the Union is Israel's uh, uh, largest source of imports and exports, and you have the figures on this slide. Bear in mind that in 2014, Israel was ranked the Union's 25th uh, major trade partner. Israel is also uh, the first non-European country fully, fully associated with the Union's research programs and uh, to that, uh, in that respect, Israel is a full member state when it comes to research and development. And by virtue of the European research program, the EU is now Israel's second biggest source of research funding. The first one, by the way, is the Israel Science Foundation. In December 2008, the EU and Israel decided to upgrade their relations within the framework of what is known as the European Neighborhood Policy, the ENP, a policy which out uh, which outreaches to all the Union's neighbors. However, in response to Israel, uh, Israel's military cooperation, uh, operation in Gaza, uh, that same month, the EU froze uh, this upgrade process, declaring uh, that this process needed to be seen in the broader context of sustained progress towards a resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Be that as it may, and in this respect, in December 2013, the European Union offered Israel a special privileged partnership. No one knows what it means. Uh, however, um, the message was that in the event of a peace agreement with the Palestinians, Israel would become a special privileged partner. Since then, however, as I said, no real content was put into this offer. Now, political relations between Israel and the EU have not always been uh, smooth uh, and by and large have lagged behind the institutional economic ones. In a sense, Israeli-EU relations can be described as unfolding on two parallel tracks, uh, with the economic one far exceeding uh, the political one. Now, I'd like now to move on to identify the key Israeli perceptions and attitudes towards the European Union, um, namely how Israelis see the European Union, their largest trade partner, and their immediate neighbor. Now, uh, for the last decade, uh, and you have these three major Israeli perceptions, for the last decade, three major uh, perceptions widely shared by both the general public and the political elites have affected Israeli attitudes uh, towards the European Union and really influenced uh, Israeli policies vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Union. These perceptions have been first that the EU represent, uh, represents a hospitable framework for Israeli accession, and therefore that Israel could and should join the European Union within the foreseeable future. Second, that good political re uh, relations with the EU are not really critical for Israel. And third, 
that anti-Israeli attitudes and geostrategic views uh, detrimental to the security of Israel are deeply rooted in the European Union. So let's start with the perceptions, these perceptions and the Israeli general public. Later on, I'll move uh, uh, and discuss uh, the political elites in Israel and uh, the Israeli media. So the most fundamental uh, Israeli perception uh, has to do with this maybe new Israeli flag. Um, and that is uh, to say that the Union represents a hospitable framework for Israeli accession. Now, this perception, which is driven uh, by Israelis' hopes, desires, and expectations of joining the European Union, is borne out uh, by numerous surveys, uh, together with Dr. Lars Hensel, the director of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung here in Washington, but the former director of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung in Jerusalem, we conducted several surveys on Israeli attitudes towards the EU, its member states, and Germany. Now, our 2009 survey, and later on our 2013 survey, reveals that 69% of the respondents uh, supported the idea that Israel should join the European Union. Even more dramatic were the results in our 2011 survey, in which an overwhelming majority of 81% of the Israelis supported the idea that Israel should join and could join the European Union. Now, while this perception has deep historical roots, as I said, in 1957, Israel was looking into uh, the idea of full membership in the European Economic Community, this perception also reflects the fact that since the 2007 EU enlargement, Israel may well have what is proportionally the largest population outside the European Union of would-be EU citizens. 42%, 42% of Israeli Jews are identified as potential EU citizens by virtue of their European ancestry. Now, many of those, moreover, are taking up this new opportunity, and according to my 2013 survey, 9% of Israelis are currently holding EU citizenship. Now, the second perception, and let's go back to, let's move on to that, let's go back to that slide. The second perception, namely that good political relations with the EU are not really critical for Israel, might be said uh, to be contradictory to the first. And yet the paradox is, that is alive and well in the Israeli public. Thus, for instance, um, in the 2013 survey, 64% of uh, people polled considered relations with the Union or any EU member state or in international organizations as far less vital for Israel than relations with the United States. Uh, in fact, only 8% of Israelis considered relations with the EU as more important than relations with the United States. Now, furthermore, 69% um, of the respondents said that in thinking about Israeli culture, they feel that they have much more in common with Americans than with Europeans. The third fundamental perception, namely that anti-Israeli attitudes and geostrategic uh, views detrimental to the security of Israel are uh, deeply rooted in the EU, might be said to follow from the second and to further accentuate uh, the tension with the first. Now, underlying this perception are Israeli feeling that large parts of the European Union uh, are simply anti-Semitic. 83% of Israelis consider the European Union or perceive the European Union to be an anti-Semitic entity. More than that, more than 50% of Israelis consider the European Union to be an Islamophobic entity. Now, 
Let's move on to the Israeli political elites, and maybe I'll mention some European political elites as well. By and large, uh, Israeli leaders tend to share with the general public all the three perceptions uh, that I've mentioned. The first perception uh, has been uh, publicly expressed by key political figures in recent years, the most prominent of which are the Foreign Minister of Victor Lieberman and the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. In November 2010, for instance, then serving as Deputy Minister and Minister for Foreign Affairs, Lieberman announced that Israel should become a member of the EU. And according to Lieberman, and I quote him, as regards economics, cultural affairs, tourism, and human values, we feel part of United Europe. And Israel should become a full member of the European Union. It is impossible to imagine modern Europe without Jewish spirit. Israel sees itself as part of Europe and does not seek to redivide territory." End of quote. In the same vein, Benjamin Netanyahu, when he served as a foreign minister 2002, he actually declared that Israel favors joining the European Union and asked Italy to help Israel to achieve this goal. Curiously, there have also been voices in the European Union that support such thinking, um, undoubtedly uh, feeding this Israeli perception uh, that Israeli membership in the European Union is possible. Among those vo voices, for instance, uh, for instance, has been um, that of Lithuania's Prime Minister, Andrius Kublius, uh, who in December 2010 told to an Israeli audience, to a group of Israeli students, uh, that he fully support the idea of Israeli membership in the EU, and quote, I am willing to vote this tomorrow, for this tomorrow. I'm a big supporter of Israel's accession to the EU, and no doubt I will vote accordingly. Um, for him, uh, the reason uh, to support such, is, such, an, such an idea is um, um, simply because it will help Europe uh, to cope with the global economy. And I quote him again, uh, Israel, uh, Israel uh, is a large mass of brain power that will help us Europeans to compete with these markets, end of quote. Now, another notable EU leader uh, espousing such views uh, has been Silvio Berlusconi, the former Italian prime minister who for years advocated uh, full Israeli membership in the European Union. Just some, uh, um, some statements, Italy will support Israeli membership in the EU. Israel is a completely European country in terms of standard of living, heritage and cultural values. Geography is not a determinant. Uh, then he said, this is my biggest dream because we Europeans consider Israel to be one of the European countries. Significantly, uh, Berlusconi's statements were not only dismissed by fellow European leaders, but actually supported by several European leaders. Uh, Javier Solana, for example, who was serving as the Union's High Representative for Common Foreign and Security Policy, stated in Jerusalem that Israel was, for all intents and purposes, already a full member of the European Union. Now, leading Israeli figures also seem to share the public perception that good political relations with the EU are not really critical for Israel, uh, or at least believe that expressing this perception is politically expedient for them. Traditionally, I must say, the most vocal proponents of this perception uh, have belonged to the nationalist right. Uh, and in recent years, these included uh, Netanyahu, Lieberman, and Naftali Bennett. Um, this perception is almost always voiced in response to European criticism of Israeli policies uh, towards the Palestinians. Thus, for instance, um, reacting to international criticism of Israel's approval of construction plans in East Jerusalem and in the occupied territories. In December 2012, Prime Minister Netanyahu stated, and I quote, what Europe and the international community say is simply of no interest to me. End of quote. 
Um, in reacting uh, to the recent judgment of the General Court of the EU that removed Hamas from the European list of terrorist organizations in 2014, uh, the Economy Minister Naftali Bennett uh, charged uh, that, and here I quote, the corrupt law of the EU court gives license for the shedding of Jewish blood everywhere and demonstrates the loss of a moral path. Bennett proclaimed that Israel is strong and simply does not need Europe, end of quote. Echoing uh, the same attitude, Victor Lieberman described the EU decision uh, of June 2013 not to add uh, Hezbollah to the list of terrorist organizations as, and this is a quote, hypocrisy incarnate which would make the EU irrelevant. Uh, and then he continues, we need to stop our dialogue with the EU. How does Europe contribute to Israeli security? I keep saying we need to cut them off. End of quote. Um, finally, Israeli political uh, elites also share the general public's perception that EU policies towards Israel are deeply rooted and rigid and even colored by anti Semitism. Uh, to be sure, this perception is voiced most strongly um, in the wake of anti Semitic attacks that take place uh, in Europe. But the fact that anti-Semitism regularly appears uh, as an item on the agenda of Israeli officials in their meetings with their European counterparts uh, suggests that Israeli officials view this matter as somehow inalienable uh, to European policy towards Israel, in particular toward the Arab-Israeli conflict in, in general. Now, at the very least, uh, the frequency and manner of Israeli irritations about anti-Semitism in Europe is a constant sore uh, in Israeli-European relations. A recent case in point was Prime Minister Netanyahu, uh, Netanyahu's statements following the January 2015 uh, shooting attacks in Paris, Kate mentioned them. Uh, Netanyahu urged Jews, uh, friend Jews, to view Israel as not just the place to which you turn in prayer, in prayer, but as your home. And then the day after, he made similar remarks in at the Grand Synagogue in Paris, uh, in which he called friend Jews uh, to emigrate to Israel. Um, Netanyahu invoked the same message following two shooting attacks uh, in Copenhagen uh, in February uh, earlier this year. Now, if the perception that good political relations with the EU are not critical for Israel is strongly associated uh, with Israel's nationalist right, so is the perception that European policies towards Israel are deeply rooted and rigid uh, and even colored by anti-Semitism. Thus, for instance, in response to the publication of the Union's July 2013 guidelines on the eligibility of Israeli entities uh, in the occupied territories to apply for EU funds, uh, Uri Ariel, the housing minister from the Jewish Home Party, charged the EU's decision on the guidelines is tainted by, and here I quote, racism, anti-Semitism, and discrimination against the Jewish people, which is reminiscent of boycotts of the Jews in Europe over 66 years ago, end of quote. Even more jarring, but no less telling, were remarks made by Lieberman as a foreign minister following the Union statement uh, criticizing Israel's new settlement construction plans. Speaking um, in his capacity as foreign minister, uh, Lieberman accused the EU foreign minister of behaving like, and here I quote, Nazi quietist, end of quote. Lieberman added, continuation of, uh, of the statement, from the point of view of some European foreign ministers, Israel destruction is apparently something that is taken for granted, end of quote. Now, the Israeli perception that European policies towards Israel are colored by anti-Semitism is so strongly refl uh, refracted by domestic political ideology 
that it has created a corollary perception that European anti-Semitism is somehow complicit with the Israeli left. Um, a startling manifestation of this perception came into view during the most recent election campaign when the Samaria Settlers Committee posted a political video clip titled The Eternal Jew, and I'd like to share this, uh, this clip with you. Um, so uh, if you didn't really get it, uh, the final image of the clip shows the logos of 10 different left-wing Israeli NGOs and the caption, the Europeans may seem different to you today, but to them you are exactly the same. Now let me move on to uh, Israeli media perceptions of the EU. And, and what we did, uh, we actually analyzed the content of four Israeli Hebrew daily newspaper, The Marker, Israel Ayom, Yediot Achronot, and the Aretz, and the analysis spans on four year period from 2011 until 2014, in which basically we examined the names or, or we looked for the names of any of the 28 member states uh, or the terms Europe, EU, etc. So uh, Haaretz and its economic supplement, the marker, actually published almost half of all the items relating to Europe, while Israel Ayom published 24% of all the news items, and Yediot Achronot published the remaining 28%. You'll be surprised to know that out of the 28 EU member states, the UK was mentioned the most often by Israeli newspapers. In Israel, there's literally an obsession with the UK when it comes to the Israeli media. Uh, the content of these items, however, had nothing to do with Israeli-UK relations. Uh, the coverage was heavily influenced by the Kate Middleton effect, uh, and most of these news items were dedicated to pure gossip uh, during that four-year period, either of the British Royal Family or the London 2012 Summer Olympic Games. It should also be emphasized that the survey further reveals that the UK is today uh, the most popular country, European country in Israel. Next to the UK, by the way, the second place uh, goes to France. Coverage was mainly dominated by gossip from the Elysee Palace and anti-Semitism uh, in France. Third country uh, is, is Germany. You'll be surprised, interestingly, that one, the one EU member state that enjoyed the most positive coverage by the Israeli media between the years 2011 and 2014 was Finland. Uh, and, and the Israeli newspapers actually uh, showed an extreme interest in the exceptional Finnish education system and really advocated for the Finnization of Israeli education. Um, on the opposite side uh, were Greece and Hungary, which received the most negative coverage uh, during uh, this four-year period. The main reason behind this negative press coverage had to do with the alarming increase of anti-Semitism uh, anti in these two countries. Now let's try to make some sense and wrap it up um, of all these findings. I'll start with the public opinion and the political elites. Uh, the first Israeli perception that the Union represents a hospitable framework for Israeli accession really dates back to 1957, the year in which Israel really uh, was looking or explored the possibility of obtaining full membership in the EEC. Now, such a perception can best be explained by Israeli wishful thinking. Um, what is surprising is the degree to which uh, senior Israeli officials, as well as European leaders, policymakers, and policy shapers um, who are familiar with the European Union cling to uh, this idea. For these views on Israel, uh, uh, on Israeli membership uh, in the EU, ignore fundamental differences between Israel's self-definition as a Jewish state and the state of the Jewish people, on the one hand, and the guiding principle of the EU of an open and unified space without sharp distinctions between citizens of member states in terms of us, 
uh, the insiders and the other on, on the other hand. Uh, moreover, I should mention that on the supranational level, Israel is not even regarded by the Union uh, institutions as a likely candidate for joining the Union in the foreseeable future. Second Israeli perception that good relations with the EU are not critical for Israel is particularly striking, uh, since political relations with the EU are simply essential for the future of the State of Israel. Not only does the Israeli economy and significant parts of its research and technology depend on cooperation with the EU, but the Union too depends on its relations with Israel on numerous levels. Um, and and um, now, if, if the first perception is in common uh, with political reality, and the second is merely in tension with it, the third Israeli perception, namely that the EU policies towards Israel are deeply rooted um, and, and the EU or large parts of the EU are anti-Semitic, uh, this one is a challenging. This perception is extremely challenging, uh, especially uh, given that many EU officials appear to share this perception with the Israelis. Theresa May, uh, the UK Home Secretary, just recently in January 2015 spoke at a service in London to remember those killed in the January 2015 terror attacks in Paris, and she admitted that in Britain, and I quote, uh, uh, Britain needs to do much more to fight anti-Semitism, uh, to address the appalling spike in anti-Semitism. Uh, May continued and, and said that these attacks uh, are a chilling reminder of anti-Semitism, not just in France, but all over Europe. She actually commented or expressed shock at the findings of a January 2015 survey showing that 45% of all Britons hold anti-Semitic views. Now, the UK Home Secretary uh, was only the more recent European official to openly reflect on uh, the state of European anti-Semitism. In December 2010, Fritz Bolkstein, a former EU commissioner, uh, ex-leader of Holland's ruling party and former Dutch Minister of Defense, sparked a heated debate in the Netherlands by saying that, and I quote, practicing Jews had no future here and should emigrate to the United States or Israel, end of quote. Bolkstein backed up his statement by noting that the increase, of, uh, increase in anti-Semitic incidents in the Netherlands and in Europe uh, over the past decade had led him to have very limited confidence in the ability of the Dutch government or indeed any other European government to fight anti-Semitism. But perhaps most telling of all are the feelings of European Jews themselves. According to a European Union survey, Europe-wide survey on Jews' experiences and perceptions of anti-Semitism commissioned by the European Commission in 2013, uh, nearly a quarter, a quarter of European Jews fear to openly identify as Jewish. More than 26% of European Jews claim to have experienced anti-Semitic harassment at least once in the past 12 months. And 34% had experienced, uh, experienced anti-Semitism over the past five years. So to conclude, Israeli images and perceptions of the EU uh, put the distinctiveness of the Union into question. Uh, since 2011, the EU deepened its political irrelevance and economic fragility for Israelis, even as it strengthened uh, its trade importance. Now, however problematic some of these perceptions might be, one should not really lose sight of the fact that they play a critical role in the relations between Israel and the European Union. While this afternoon I didn't really examine the Union's perceptions 
of Israel, there is no reason to think that they deserve less attention. This is another project that we are working on it these days. Now, let me just finish with a quote uh, from Francois Duchesne, who already cautioned us. Uh, and I quote, Israel can never be wholly foreign to Europeans. Jews are so much part of the fabric of European history and contemporary life that relations with Israel must, in some sense, be an extension of folk memories on both sides. And without understanding these memories, it will be difficult to address the perceptions and the images on which the future of Israeli-EU relations um, ultimately lies. Thank you very much. Please uh, remain at the podium. Thank you. Please uh, join me in thanking Mr. Pardo for that very insightful and uh, interesting analysis of this relationship. We're so Washington-centric in this town. We only talk about Israel through the lens of Washington, so it's very refreshing to hear about the EU's relationship with, with Israel. Um, I'm going to open uh, with a question, and then we'll turn to the audience. You mentioned you didn't get into EU perceptions. Maybe I can draw you out on that. Um, of course, there is growing frustration uh, within the EU about the uh, anti-peace process stance that Bibi Netanyahu um, uh, has been taking. And I'm um, just wondering if you could elaborate on this uh, and relate it to the question of, the, of a boycott. Um, I think you alluded in your journal piece to a campaign, a growing campaign to potentially boycott Israeli products. I think currently Israel has, um, the EU does not allow uh, products uh, that are that are made in settlements um, uh, to be brought in. So if you could elaborate on whether or not you think the EU will uh, use the boycott issue to put more pressure on Israel and also just elaborate on some of the differences, the distinctions within this boycott issue. Should I answer immediately or? Please. Well, this is a fascinating issue and of course we are waiting for this tsunami uh, which will probably come soon. However, I must, I beg to disagree with you with the term boycott. Uh, uh, at least the way that the Europeans uh, would see this, uh, this has nothing to do with a boycott. This has to do with implementation of treaties, of agreements, international agreements, uh, that the Israeli government signed with uh, the European Union. We are talking about the association agreement, the 1995 association agreement, which is basically the legal envelope that uh, uh, that is there for the relationship. Uh, the problem over there was that uh, the two parties uh, did not identify the territory of the State of Israel. For the Europeans, the territory of the State of Israel does not include uh, the occupied territories. Uh, for the Israelis, this is a different, uh, a different definition. Uh, and all these issues started there. I should really say that uh, eventually, and, and the article actually covers it, uh, covers the topic uh, quite extensively, um, eventually uh, Israel agreed to the European definition of the state of Israel. Um, Agreed, I should say, in, in a very, in a very uh, strange way, uh, but uh, uh, according to the agreement that the two parties reached, Israel would be able to continue uh, send Israeli products from the occupied territories to uh, to uh, to the European markets. However, they would have to clearly identify. Uh, uh, the postal code, the zip code of the region in which uh, these products were produced. This is a very technical issue, but I think that the message that we should deliver here is that according to the Europeans, this has nothing to do with boycotts. This has to do uh, with pure implementation of international treaties that the Israeli government signed. Later on, Israel accepted this definition in the Open Skies Agreement that was recently reached between the parties and in other agreements that uh, the European Union and Israel signed. However, it's all about that 1995 agreement in which, uh, in which uh, there's no clear definition to the territory of the State of Israel. Now, let's be very honest here. The situation, 
probably uh, uh, the current political situation between Israel and the European Union is probably, we, we reached the lowest point ever in this political relationship. Uh, Joel is here, he, Joel Peters, Professor Joel Peters from Virginia Tech, he coined that term in 90, uh, following the 1981 uh, Venice Declaration. I would argue that we've reached that point again. This is the lowest point ever of Israeli-European Union relations, uh, basically since the 2013 guidelines that the European Union published uh, regarding uh, Israeli entities in the occupied territories until Mogherini, uh, Federico Mogherini, the, the uh, new uh, uh, new foreign policy chief uh, assumed power, there were no discussions at all between Israeli leaders and EU leaders. Uh, so since uh, um, since 20 June, uh, July 2013, uh, there were no serious discussions between Israelis and European Union leaders. Of course, the European Union now waited for the results uh, of the Israeli elections and probably uh, as of May, uh, we will see um, we will see uh, some tough uh, statements on both sides. So you're expecting tough statements? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, we could go further in this, but I'll open the floor to other questions and maybe we can get back to this issue. Um, any questions for... But to follow up on Kate's question, um, could you talk then about um, sort of mass mobilization in Europe. Um, so you, you answered uh, the question in terms of state to state or EU to is the Israeli state. But is, are there, uh, I understand that there are a lot, there's a lot of social activity in Europe uh, that supports boycott, boycotting and maybe not just in the occupied territories but in Israel generally. Um, and I have a second question quick which is, is there a division in Israel about the EU between, because you mentioned 40 percent, between, uh, within the Sephardi community? Mm. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for the questions. Um, you, you've raised the, the issue of the BDS movement, the boycott, divestment, sanctions movement, and, and this is a very interesting, um, a very interesting issue. First of all, uh, probably from economic, financial perspective, the BDS movement has no influence whatsoever. This was actually quantified by several researchers and actually also by the Israeli Ministry uh, of Finances and according to their calculation, there's literally zero influence from a financial perspective. However, it has to do with the reputation of the country, and over there, of course, uh, there is uh, there's a major damage uh, to the reputation of the state of Israel when it comes to the BDS movement. Here, we should understand that this has nothing to do with the EU supranational level. This is uh, what we term the power of the local, and in recent, uh, uh, recent years, we see European locals far more active on that front. Uh, however, this should be really on the table. This has nothing to do with the European Union supranational level, which actually fights against, uh, uh, against uh, sanctions um, on Israel. Once again, the, the, the boycott issue which Kate raised earlier, according to the European uh, Union, uh, uh, this is pure implementation of, of agreements and nothing to do with the BDS uh, movement. Um, you've raised a very interesting topic uh, which has to do with the Sephardi and the Ashkenazi um, and the Ashkenazi division in Israel. Um, you know, uh, um, this is a different research. Uh, this became a national obsession, a national sport in Israel, obtaining a second, uh, a second uh, citizenship. I'm just living across of the Polish embassy in Israel, and I can tell you that every morning I see these lines of Israelis waiting for uh, for second Israeli, uh, second European passport. When we interview these guys, and we do. Uh, uh, it's, it's actually quite fascinating uh, to hear their answers. Uh, for them, to them, this is, first of all, uh, a status symbol. Uh, we hold a second citizenship. Secondly, it's, and, and I quote, an umbrella for a rainy day. 
uh, that's how they perceive it. Uh, uh, and yes, there's this division of Sephardi and Ashkenazi. Now with the Sephardim, now that Spain is about to uh, allow uh, uh, Sephardim for Spanish, uh, Spanish citizenship, probably this will solve part of the problem. Uh, this is a new act that was enacted by the Spanish uh, parliament and, um, uh, and, and Sephardim will be able eventually to get uh, a Spanish citizenship and by the way also by the Portuguese government. So this would solve this issue but it's absolutely a national obsession and, and, and a national sport uh, holding a second, uh, second citizenship. Sounds like Lebanon. Uh, <laughs> it's the Middle East. Yes, got to have a second passport. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Lars Hensel. My name was mentioned already. <laughs> um, I want to ask you about the second point. You know, the perception that uh, the political relationship um, to the European Union is not so important for Israelis. Um, did you get a sense how much this is related to a perception of the European Union in general as a, as a leader uh, in, in the world? Um, I could imagine that it has, has to do something with um, a political cover, for instance, the European Union might be able to give to Israel in the United Nations or in other uh, bodies. Um, as well to uh, uh, maybe the perception how much uh, security the European Union might be able to provide, or is this a purely you know bilateral kind of um, uh, perception? Thanks. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Lars didn't mention that he's the director of the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung here in Washington. Thank you very much for your question. Um, well, you know this. This, this uh, specific research, which I conduct for the past uh, nine years, uh, is part of a larger, of a larger research uh, which examines uh, third countries' perceptions towards the European Union. We belong to a, a network which is actually coordinated by New Zealand, by, the, uh, by a research team in New Zealand, and we examine basically 70 countries all over the world and their perceptions towards the European Union. The fascinating thing is that when it comes to Israel, we get a completely different picture. Uh, most of the countries would perceive the European Union to be a political dwarf and even uh, despite or despite the, the financial crisis, they would still perceive it to be an economic power. When it comes to Israel, uh, we get actually the opposite uh, uh, the opposite uh, perception. Uh, for Israelis, the European Union is a political power and an economic dwarf. Uh, and it has to do, of course, with the fact that every other day you'll see a European foreign minister landing in the country, and the fact that Israelis take Europe for granted. Europe is just there. It's two and a half, or, or actually 31 minutes from, from Israel if you fly to uh, Nicosia, Cyprus. Um, and, 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 and we get really this strange uh, uh, picture of a political power and an economic dwarf. However, I should I should say um, the, the the perception that Europe is is of no importance has to do, of course, with U.S. Israeli relations. Um, and and uh, I must admit that uh, despite what you hear uh, and and read, probably uh, the U.S. above. First of all, the U.S. is the most popular country in Israel. Uh, George Bush used to enjoy, uh, President Bush used to enjoy over 90% of Israeli uh, support. Obama is, just before the current crisis, was around 60% of support. Angela Merkel, as you know, is by far more popular in Israel than President Obama. Uh, uh, but still, I mean, President Obama has around 60% of support, and it has to do uh, with the support or, or the perceptions, uh, the perception that Israelis uh, see themselves closer to the US. And, and they wouldn't count on the European Union. When it comes to security, 
clearly uh, we get these results either in surveys or uh, from, from the political elite. Uh, they cannot and they wouldn't count on the European Union. The only exception was the EU BAM force in Rafa, in the Rafa crossing, and still over there it was all about monitoring uh, a, very, a very specific uh, place. Uh, the Israelis simply refuse uh, to support the European Union when it comes to, to security. Be that as it may, um, we saw how important is research and development uh, cooperation with the European Union. Uh, you're following the, the, the guidelines, the 2013 guidelines, um, eventually Israel really struggled to sign uh, a new agreement, a new research and development agreement with the European Union. And bear in mind that it has nothing to do with the money. Um, eventually, the money, that, that's not the issue. For the Israeli researchers, it's all about the networks. Being a researcher today is, is all about the network, and, and the Israeli uh, researchers realized the importance of these European networks, um, and, and that was really the main reason why they literally fought for the Horizon 2020, for the research and development program. Um, and, and I would say that research and development became a major, major issue. Years ago, by the way, funds came from the US. These days, this is no longer the case. It's really the European Union. And Israeli research and development is, in a way, absolutely dependent on, on, on uh, European research and development and innovation. Thank you very much, uh, Benjamin, to a no affiliation. Uh, how closely uh, do uh, European anti-Semitic uh, attitudes follow uh, Israeli actions, such as the uh, recent uh, conflict uh, with Gaza, the, uh, the uh, ships, the uh, Mavi Marvoru, and, and other incidents uh, of that sort? and. Uh, to what extent is the anti-Semitism uh, disproportionately reflected in the Muslim communities in mm -hmm. the various European states? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for your question. This is, of course, uh, a raw nerve in, 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 in Israeli-European relations. Um, and, and I'm not an expert on the topic. I mean, I study Israeli-European Union relations and not really uh, European or, or general, in general, anti-Semitism. One thing is clear, uh, Israeli government actions in the occupied territories would clearly, um, uh, would clearly uh, end up eventually with anti-Semitic attacks uh, in, in Europe. Unfortunately, this is nothing, I mean, this is not me, this is the European Union admitted <laughs> in uh, the early 2000, uh, that was a 20, 2003 or 2004, uh, famous study, uh, um, the, the research that was conducted by the European Union uh, claimed that most of the anti-Semitic attacks are coming from non-white Christians, uh, citizens, EU citizens, uh, or, or residents, that's to use, if, if I use correctly, uh, the terms used by the European Union. Um, it's, it's a major issue, and it's a major issue uh, uh, for the Israelis. Uh, I didn't cover it, uh, I didn't mention it in, in my presentation. However, uh, European anti-Semitism is also a major issue uh, for Israeli media. Uh, the Israeli media would cover heavily uh, European anti-Semitism, um, and and you would see anti-Semitic attacks in front pages, uh, in all the Israeli media sources. Uh, I must say something else here. When we interview the editors of these uh, of these newspapers or or uh, news sources, uh, they were very honest to tell us that. And sorry for, and, and here I quote, but sorry for the terrible quotation, they told us that anti-Semitism sells newspapers. So they would heavily cover uh, anti-Semitic incidents in Europe. 
Um, it's, it's a major, major issue in, uh, for Israelis. However, you see this strange, uh, strange relationship between 81, 82% of Israelis that would like to join the European Union uh, and that figure or, or this, this, this exact number uh, would see the European Union as an anti-Semitic entity. How do you explain that? That's not an easy one. We would like to join the European Union even though it's an anti-Semitic entity. That's not an easy one. Okay, one final question. It, uh, well, one second, she's bringing you the uh, microphone. And if you could introduce yourself, please. I'm Adel Shemov, University of Maryland. How much, if any, the last Gaza war in July had an impact on the views you expressed? Well, we checked that, and that's, that's thank you very much, that's, that's a very important question. We, in, in the past eight years that we conduct this research, uh, we witness uh, what the, the findings were that around 60% of Israelis would generally support the European Union. Following the last uh, war operation, uh, we see uh, an incredible drop. Uh, we are talking about around 30% of Israelis that would support uh, EU actions. Of no less importance, uh, on average, most the, the, the Israeli media coverage of the European Union tended to be neutral to positive. Uh, in the past year, uh, it actually, we see a completely different picture. It really follows the general public and the political elite. Um, I would dare say that the Israeli media these days simply slaughters the European Union on a daily basis. Uh, and we see an extremely negative coverage of the European Union. This has to do with another issue. As I said, the European Union simply doesn't talk to Israel. Since July 2013, uh, the European Union leadership doesn't uh, speak to Israelis. Israelis do not talk to European Union leaders as well. Uh, uh, but, but that's an issue. There's an urgent need to talk uh, on a people-to-people -people level as well. Uh, and, and that's a major, major issue. Well, clearly the lack of a peace process is at the heart of all this, and we're going to be talking about this issue in two weeks' time. We're doing a panel on Israel uh, and the peace process, the future of the peace process, so uh, please look for that flyer when we send it out soon. Also, just a reminder to come up and uh, buy one of our uh, Middle East journals, and uh, please join me in thanking Mr. Pardo for this very excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you.